I looked up the road and we saw basically like a little hut. It was a, a logger's cabin that's kind of standard for operations like this. We saw the smoke and then then I see a, a logger approaching us pretty quickly on foot. At that point, we, we decide that we, we have to make an exit, we have to escape. In September, the reporter Alexander Salmon travelled to Romania to investigate illegal logging. He knew going in that there had been a spate of attacks on journalists and environmentalists in the forest. In 2015, an environmentalist named Gabriel Paun was beaten unconscious by loggers. The former Minister of Waters and Forests was poisoned with mercury in 2017 after she tried to crack down on illegal logging. In 2019, two forest rangers were murdered. And in 2021, just before Alex arrived, a documentary film crew was ambushed in their car by a group of 15 armed men. What has made the forest so dangerous is the global appetite for wood. Romania is home to one of the largest and most important old growth forests left in the world. And until relatively recently, the land was publicly owned and protected. And here's where the story takes another turn, because some of that land has since passed to big corporate owners. Harvard University owns swathes of the forest. And now the biggest private landowner in Romania just so happens to be the world's single largest consumer of wood, IKEA. Today on the show, we're talking about what happens to that illegally logged wood. Who buys it? Where does it end up? And can you even know where the wood in your furniture came from? I'm Laura Marsh. And I'm Alex Perry. This is The Politics of Everything. This episode is supported by Earth Justice. The United States has rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement under President Biden. But there's something missing in Biden's climate strategy. Protecting the old growth and mature trees that naturally absorb carbon and help us fight climate change. Earth Justice, a national legal nonprofit, is calling for the protection of these irreplaceable climate forests across our public lands. Join us in telling Biden to act now. Text OLD GROWTH to 43428. When Alexander Salmon was reporting the story, he spent some time accompanying a Romanian activist, Andre, who was documenting logging in protected areas. Andre isn't his real name. He asked to be referred to by a pseudonym for his protection. One day, Alex and Andre were driving on back roads near the Vidraru Dam, a few hours by car from Bucharest. They were searching for a spot they'd seen on satellite photos that looked like it had been recently logged. As we got close, we actually saw... Uh, a placard, a little roadside placard that announced that there was a locking permit for the area that had expired, I think, at the end of July. So no active logging should have been going on. And we kind of kept going up this uh, this muddy road, this logging road. And we noticed that there were deep tracks in the mud that suggested that there had been trucks there recently. And then finally, we kind of round the corner and, and see a bunch of big logs stacked on the side of the road. And these logs were, were fresh and you could smell it and you could hear even the sound of chainsaws at this point. There was kind of an ambient hum of, of chainsaws. So we knew it was active. And Andre had been using a drone to document the logging that you encountered. So he launched the drone and he was taking pictures. And then you saw a hut, like a logger's cabin and a logger approaching. And there's actually not enough time to even get the drone down. So we dive into the car, Andre's in the driver's seat, and he hands me the drone controls and, and tells me to, to try my best to fly it to a, a location ahead of us where we might be able to wow. to pick it up. And yeah, at that point, we, we're, we're driving as fast as we can down this road. We're, we're kind of thrashing our way through these potholes and, and, uh, and on the escape. So obviously you made it out okay, you're speaking to us now, but why were you afraid of encountering a logger in a forest in Romania? Well, Romania has actually this sordid history, sort of recent history of violence around logging and illegal logging in particular. In the last handful of years, there have been six separate murders of forest rangers or environmentalists who've who've come across illegal logging outfits. I think the most recent stats say that 650 Incidents have occurred, whether they be beatings or you know attempted murders. Two days prior to my getting there, there was an attack on two journalists and an environmentalist. So the very recent history of that particular attack was looming pretty large in our minds at that moment. So what did you know about the attack by the time you arrived? It was a, a local documentary film crew, a director and a videographer from Bucharest. And they were working on a project about the illegal logging trade in Romania. And they had teamed up with an environmentalist 
this guy named Tiberiu. He's something of like a vigilante in a lot of ways. He's a very popular Facebook page. And he, for the last five years, has kind of built a reputation by staking out illegal logging sites, confronting loggers, chasing down trucks that have illegally harvested wood on them. In the absence of, you know, real robust legal enforcement, he's kind of taken it on himself to do a lot of this stuff. And, and so these two were following him. They'd, they'd gone on a four-day trip to shadow him. And on the last day, they uh, were attacked. The attack was brutal. Fifteen men armed with bats and axes. One member of the crew was beaten unconscious. The attackers even broke their car keys so that the men couldn't escape. They thought they were going to die. Finally, the film director managed to call the police, who eventually showed up. Well, I want to shift to asking why this is happening in Romania. Why is it in Romania, particularly, where there are so many of these old-growth forests to be illegally logged? Yeah, it's an interesting contingency of, of history and geography where you have the Carpathian Mountains in Romania are home to these kind of incredible forests of spruce, of beech, of oak, of various trees. And because of Romania's status as a Soviet state, those forests were, were largely protected from the global market for quite some time. So with the fall of communism, these forests were opened up to the European market and to kind of global exploitation. So now they're one of the few remaining old growth forests in Europe, but they're also under extreme pressure because of that status. So Romanian communism ended in 1989. They joined the European Union in 2007. By the time that happened, major companies already identified Romanian forests as a huge asset. What's happened to the forests since Romania joined the EU? More or less in that time, we've seen like somewhere between half and two thirds of the virgin forest in Romania has been uh, destroyed. Hmm. A lot of people might not understand why the stakes are so high, why there are these attacks, why it's so fraught. What is at stake in clearing this last of the old growth forests? Yeah, it's, I mean, there's a lot of money on the line is, is one thing. There are huge uh, multinational timber corporations and there are furniture companies like IKEA, which happens to be the largest landowner, uh, largest private landowner in Romania, who all have a lot riding on those trees becoming things like chairs and particle board and, and bed frames and, and the like. And on the other side, you have the European Union and its climate commitments and its biodiversity commitments, actually, which are, I think, are less sort of less prominent and less widely known. Those forests are extremely important because they're not only the most effective carbon capture method on the planet, the old growth forests capture carbon at, at this incredible rate that's not seen in logged and replanted forests. But they're also, you know, a, they serve as an ecosystem for bears and lynx and other endangered or threatened species. How did IKEA get involved? I mean, how does IKEA end up owning a forest in Romania? It's actually a very interesting saga, I think. As part of the liberalization of the Romanian economy after the fall of communism, they instated this land restitution law, which basically said that, you know, the, the Soviet state claimed all of this forest land as, as public land, obviously, as it, when it was under a communist regime. And the newly liberalized Romanian state wanted to return those forests to the private owners who had had them before communism. Mm -hmm. And so they, they put in this land restitution law, which obviously from the very get-go was plagued by massive corruption. And so you hear these stories about so, you know grandmas in, in retirement homes in Prague hiring a lawyer and then coming away with thousands of hectares of private forest land in Romania where they haven't lived. They don't even share the same last name as the people who had it before communism. And a huge percentage of, of the forest land, it's a privatized basically like that in these fly-by-night operations. There's no administration to really even verify these claims. But people do that, and they end up holding these tracts of forest and immediately selling them because they want to cash out. And one of the big investors in Romania in this period is the Harvard University Endowment. And so Harvard mm -hmm. contracts a Romanian businessman to go out and look for prime investment opportunities out here. And within a number of years, Harvard is actually the largest private landowner, I think outside of maybe the church at that point, but even then it's mm -hmm. not clear. And Harvard University is the proud owner of uh, an incredible percentage of Romanian forest land. So Harvard University doesn't sell firewood, it doesn't make furniture. Why would they want to own a forest in Romania? The Harvard University Endowment is, like any, I think, institutional investor, always looking for 
opportunities for <laughs> any way to make a quick buck, I, in essence, is what they're doing. The opportunity to, to buy that much land on the cheap, I think, was seen as like a great investment opportunity. Yeah. And so they snatched it up just like they would snatch up retirement homes or, or gyms or trailer parks or any other sort of like asset class that might be underexploited given political conditions or anything else. So the way this land passes from harbour to Ikea is a bit complicated, if I understand correctly, because the way the land had been handed over meant that other people were making claims to the land Harvard had, and Harvard found itself facing these disputes. And they eventually decide it's not really worth it. And they flip it to Ikea, who's a ready and willing buyer for n- numerous reasons. Yeah, I mean, Harvard is sort of a, an investment bank with a university attached to it. The part of this story that I find so interesting is that it embodies so many of the contradictions of the sort of post-Cold War European project. Like, on the one hand, these old growth forests in Romania are a key part of the EU's commitment to meeting its climate goals. And Romania's entry into the EU is is the thing that says you are now responsible for ensuring that these old growth forests are the things that, that help c- take all this carbon out of the atmosphere. And at the same time, the project that they pursue even more enthusiastically is liberalizing the market so that suddenly these private actors can go in there and start carving up these forests to sell on the international market. Like that sums up the entire sort of post-Soviet, post-communist EU world to me. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. With one hand, you open up the the market so that this labor pool and this natural resource can be exploited, you know, all over the world. And on the other hand, you're saying we got to take care of this and, and make sure that it's under close watch and it's crucial for our sort of environmental commitments. I think Less than 4% of European forest land is, is intact at this point. Like what Europe has done to its forests is, is quite clear. The track record is, is obvious. And now all eyes are on this one patch of not even a huge country. It's one, a small swath of land, ultimately, and these two warring impulses that the EU has are, are borne out right there. After the break, we'll be talking more about how IKEA fits into all of this. This episode is supported by Earth Justice. The United States has rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement under President Biden. But we can't live up to our international climate commitments without the missing link in Biden's climate strategy. We must protect the old growth and mature trees that naturally absorb carbon dioxide and help us fight climate change. The timber industry is more likely to target these trees for logging because they fetch the highest dollar value. Earth Justice, a national legal nonprofit, is calling to protect these irreplaceable climate forests across our public lands. Along with a coalition of more than 80 organizations, we are pushing the Biden administration to act now. Join us. Text Old Growth to 43428. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. We're going to get to Ikea's place in this story in a little bit. But first, I want to get into why it's so hard to prevent this from happening. You know, Romania is not on their own here. They're part of the EU. The EU has climate goals and biodiversity goals that that should be stopping this illegal logging from happening. Do they have the capability to enforce the regulations around logging in places like Romania? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is no. The interesting thing about what's going on right now in Romania is that uh, you have a number of these forests are technically protected under the Natura 2000 designation, which is a biodiversity designation. It's these particular parts of the landscape that are of exceptional value to biodiversity and to endangered species and, and the like. It actually isn't even a climate commitment that protects these areas. There actually really aren't any enforceable climate statutes. Like the EU can't sue Romania for doing bad environmental activity because mm. of logging that's going on there, but they can sue Romania because they aren't protecting these particular forests that are of, of high value to biodiversity generally. And so there's a legal process that's ongoing. I mean, again, the enforcement is not substantial because there is no force for enforcement, but they do have a, a legal process where they can basically haul the country before the European Court of Justice and hold it in contempt and eventually, in theory, force it to amend its laws such that or its actions such that these areas are protected. It's in, in theory in the last stage of that process, but the enforcement mechanisms obviously seem to be pretty weak. So let's talk about IKEA. 
If I were to ask an IKEA spokesperson to explain what they're doing on this land that they own in Romania, what would they tell me? So IKEA has has a pretty good environmental reputation. It, obviously, it's highly curated and it's something they care greatly about. So if you were to ask them what they're doing buying up forest land in Romania, they would say, we are invested in environmental stewardship and our forest management is as good as anybody else's, if not better. And so our purchasing this land is actually a show of our commitment to the area. We abide by national laws. We abide by the certification of the Forest Stewardship Council, which confers the FSC stamp is the you know, sort of gold standard in forestry. And they would say that they're you know doing, according to all that anyone can ask of them, they're doing a good job. They're, they're doing a sustainable job. And actually what they would say about what they have said about what they're doing in Romania is actually unrelated to their furniture business. And and what they would say is that largely what they're doing is they're buying this forest land. And right now they're only selling logging concessions that would turn into firewood. And so they're not a major player in in the wood markets, these small tracks for, for logging into firewood. And they're not engaged in the sort of extractive industry in the way that you might think they are. The loggers that you saw doing the illegal logging were not like IKEA employees wearing like blue IKEA uniforms. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, yeah, they weren't carrying around those plastic those blue plastic bags and wearing yeah. like the yellow, blue and yellow <laughs> IKEA vests, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the chain of custody of the wood is actually a useful way to sort of get into this. Totally. So, in most situations, the way IKEA comes up with its furniture is there are logging companies that will buy concessions from a forest owner of any, you know, a private or public forest owner. And so they buy the concession, they go out, they cut the trees down, and then they take them to a wood depot. And from there, they'll sell the wood to a mill, which is another company, you know, a different private entity. And the mill will take the logs and they'll turn it into planks, they'll turn it into particle board, they'll turn it into you know, the pieces that will eventually become furniture. And the, the mill can sell those then to a furniture company. Something like in Romania, there are companies like Egger that do this work and they take the wood pieces and they turn them into pieces that become a piece of furniture. They do that work and Ikea has a contract with them. So Ikea just goes to one of these companies, these contractors and says, look, we need a thousand folding chairs. We'll give you five euros a chair. And so that company has to go out and find enough wood to make into the chair or the pieces of the chair. That's how they operate. They have a contract with someone who then has a contract with someone who then has a contract with someone At each link in that chain, there obviously is a different management group and there's plausible deniability and there's and there's a lack of visibility. And they would say, well, the Forest Stewardship Council goes and verifies these groups and and ensures that they're doing sustainable activity. And indeed, almost all of those groups are verified by the FSC as being uh, sustainable operations. But actually tracing a log from you know, the forest to Ikea's final ownership is, is extremely difficult. I mean, it's just ultimately very hard to know if a log is legally or illegally felled. And so in a, in a place like Romania where there's, where there's more illegal logging than there is legal logging, you can have a pretty strong sense that the wood that they're getting is not coming to them in entirely copacetic ways. What are some of the ways that the illegal loggers and then I guess the mills too, how do they disguise their tracks? What are some of the, their methods? It's constantly evolving. What I was told is that most of it happens at night now. Loggers will go into an area, they'll cut down more trees than they're allowed to cut down. They'll load them up on trucks. The trucks are supposed to submit pictures of their haul to a database that's run by the Romanian government to prove that they're not taking more than they should be. But there are obviously an incredible array of creative workarounds on this. So Truckers will take pictures of just a small percentage of the truck, and they'll claim that it's just a couple logs. They'll do things like putting water on the camera lens so you can't tell what's in the photo at all. They'll transport at night when they're less likely to get detained. And of course, the forest guard in Romania doesn't even work nights and weekends, so it's not like they're going to detain them then anyways. And then they'll take them to a wood depot, and then they'll get mixed up with the legal logs, or they'll they'll grind them up into particle board, you know, into wood chips, and you could never, it'd be impossible to tell which which log is legal then and which one is not. And then they get, you know, handed off up the chain, and away they go. And that feels like a really important part of the IKEA part of this, because IKEA presumably, I mean, IKEA is not doing this themselves, but they presumably have to know what's going on, and therefore have to know they're benefiting from it. Yeah, right. I mean, it would just be implausible. The IKEA's investment in in Romania, in Eastern Europe and Russia, that's the region that they've invested the most resources in. Their growth is predicated on that area above all else. That area also happens to be 
one where illegal logging is is totally rampant. I mean, outside of Romania, even in Ukraine and Russia, this stuff is is commonplace. And that can't, obviously is not lost on them. They have a good sense of their supply chains. They wouldn't leave these things up to chance. And at the rate in which they're growing, they're growing at least at two million trees per year. Is is the is the the data point that is commonly talked about? You, there's not that much wood. You know, ultimately, if you're going to mm. say that. 55% of Romanian logging is illegal, which is what the government mm-hmm. found in, in a recent report. How could they possibly get enough wood to, to satisfy the production that they need to, to be the sort of dominant global player that they are? They benefit from this, even if it's only tacitly, because there really isn't even enough enforcement or visibility to prove one way or another how any individual log has been, has been acquired. Right. You also point out quite an unusual dynamic in the piece, which is that whenever there have been signs that there might be some enforcement, this hasn't actually stopped efforts, but it's in fact encouraged them to accelerate. Why is that? Yeah. And this was something that that Andre told me while he was doing his investigation. And actually the rush is on right now. And the the more attention that's been paid to this issue and the closer that they've gotten to regulation, actually it's increased the amount of blogging activity because People, forest owners and, and logging companies are worried that if a law is implemented that would slow down their logging, it would come in the near future. So you might as well log now. You log as much as you can now because you're not sure that you're going to be able to in the future. And oftentimes, the expected sort of environmental provisions that that I think the EU will eventually try to put in place would say that an old growth forest, if it's 80% untouched, will be protected. But if it's 70% untouched, it doesn't qualify for protection. So there's an incentive, obviously, to log what you have and, and degrade it as much as possible so it won't be eligible for protection in the future. And in, in this interesting way, the closer they've gotten to getting a handle on the situation, actually the worse things have got because there's this perverse incentive now to log as much while you still can and try to beat the regulatory intervention. I never like to ask how individual people can react to discovering this kind of information. And I don't like talking about the way you know consumers can vote with their dollar and not buy from Ikea. But if you are in Ikea and you're shopping for furniture, can you even find out what came from Romania and what didn't? It's really hard to tell. It's actually almost impossible. If you were to go to Ikea right now and look at what's on the shelves there in, in, in the stock room, the furniture pieces will say, you know, made in Romania, made in Poland, made in Russia. But that only tells you the last link of the chain. It shows you where they kind of assembled the pieces and put them together. And it doesn't tell you where the wood's coming from. Uh, mm-hmm. And that information is not publicly available. So. so you were tipped off to these codes that could help someone figure out the source of the wood and the furniture. And then you you actually went to an Ikea and, and you found furniture that could be sourced to a company. Tell me about the company it could be sourced to. Yeah, I was tipped off to this one, just one code that corresponded to, to Plimob, which was a Romanian-based manufacturer. Again, it's not owned by Ikea, but I think something between like 96 and 98% of their product goes to Ikea. I was tipped off with their code and I took it with me on the way down to the Ikea here in Brooklyn, and look through the chairs, trying to find if if I could you know, identify something that had come from there. And, and sure enough, after a little while, I found a handful of chairs that had that multiple digit code that indicated they'd come from from that particular company. And that company, Plimob, had actually recently been implicated in sourcing illegally logged wood for its chairs. The information is there, but it's certainly not publicly available. And as like a consumer, there's almost no way you could expect to find those things out and act mm-hmm. or shop accordingly. Well, I also wonder how much it matters, because this is kind of a case study in logging from one region, and you've uncovered a lot of violence and attacks and illegal activity and stuff that is bad for the environment and the climate. But is it is what's happening in Romania significantly different to what's happening in forests in, say, China or Russia or other places that may also account for a lot of the supply of wood to fast furniture companies? I, I don't think it is. I think it's pretty standard. These are the ravages of low-cost products. And if, if you're going to get a chair for $25, 
someone along the line is paying for that in, in essence. And these supply chains move around. It's likely that he has focus has, has even moved to other countries in the region to, to Poland and, and Russia, like you say. And if you're getting something that cheap, that means that they're getting the wood for even cheaper. And at a certain point, the reason they're getting it so cheaply is because it's being extracted in those ways. And, and ultimately, though, that's the expectation and the contribution of, of super low cost anything. It's certainly true in furniture in particular. It's funny because I think part of the mythology of a company like IKEA is the idea that they had this innovation where they could flat pack everything and you put it together and that was the cost saving, that you, the consumer, are assembling the furniture and so you're taking off the price of that labor from it and that's why it's cheap. But of course, the thing it's made of is wood and so the base price is going to be set by the amount that wood costs. Yeah, I, I mean, it's much less glamorous, and obviously, a company like that would not like you to think about it in this way. But ultimately, IKEA is, is an extractive industry, like Exxon Mobil or any of these other companies that are engaged in extractive activities. It's a wood company at the end of the day, and how they get that wood and how they get it cheaply is, I think, an important part of of the story. There are estimates to say that IKEA consumes one percent of wood globally, which makes it the most outstanding wood consumer on the planet as a company. That's the game that they're involved in. And there's a lot of branding and a lot of corporate messaging and strategy that goes to make it seem, you know, like it's actually about design or something else. But that's ultimately what it is. Thanks so much, Alex. Yeah, thanks, guys. You can read Alexander Salmon's story, IKEA's Race for the Last of Europe's Old Growth Forest, in the March issue of The New Republic or on TNR.com. The Politics of Everything is co produced by Talkhouse. Emily Cook is our executive producer. Myron Kaplan is our audio editor. If you enjoy the show and you want to help support it, one thing you can do is rate and review it wherever you get your podcasts. Every review helps. As always, thanks for listening. This episode is supported by Earth Justice. The United States has rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement under President Biden. But there's something missing in Biden's climate strategy. Protecting the old growth and mature trees that naturally absorb carbon and help us fight climate change. Earth Justice, a national legal nonprofit, is calling for the protection of these irreplaceable climate forests across our public lands. Join us in telling Biden to act now. Text OLD GROWTH to 43428.